Working out can be tough. Anyone here ever go to the gym, go try to work out? I mean, not like, are you actively doing it now, but have you ever? Anybody raise your hand. Let's see. Anybody go and work out? Yeah, it's a good time. It can feel great to, after you work out and things like that. You go to the gym, and uh, there's a lot of different things you can work out because we have very complex bodies, right? Sometimes we go to the gym, and it's leg day. All right, I'm going to focus on my legs. going to do all those things that's going to get my legs stronger and bigger and all that, whatever you're looking to do. Or maybe it's cardio day. You go, you say, hey, I'm going to get on the treadmill or I'm going to get on the bike and I'm going to go and my heart is going to get a great workout. Or maybe it's core day or upper body day and you go and you say, I'm going to work this out and I'm going to feel great afterwards. Well, I was talking with one of the young men in my small group on Tuesday and one of the things we started to talk about was a full body workout. Full body workout is when you go to the gym and you say, hey, there's lots of different muscles all over the place, but I'm going to try to work them all out on the same day. So you get in there, you start to go do some push-ups, maybe you get in some squats, you do some lunges, maybe you got some burpees that's uh, using lots of different um, muscles all throughout your body, maybe you're doing some running, and then finally at the end, the dreaded Stairmaster. Oh, you got to watch out for the Stairmaster. That one will make you sore for sure. But you work out all these different things, and you got to be careful on uh, that full body workout day because that can take a lot out of you. Now, it is important for us to get exercise for all of our body because it's all important, but every once in a while, it may come time that you got to skip leg day. You're like, I just don't think I have it in me. I'm going to skip that one particular day. And today, as we come and we talk about that, while it's all right a little bit to maybe skip out on here or there, uh, as long as you get it down the road, today we're not just going to be talking about a full body workout, we're going to be talking about full body worship. Full body worship, what does it mean for us to engage every part of who we are in our worship of God, our sovereign creator? What does that look like to say, no, I'm not going to leave this one part of my life out and say, God, I'm not going to worship you over here with this part of me, but instead to say, Lord, take all of us. I know I was created for a purpose, and that purpose is to worship you. Today we continue in our series, The Good Life. Uh, We're going through the book of Ecclesiastes in 12 weeks. And one of the things we're going to focus in on today is that idea of worship. I started to think about this as I was reading. I'm like, why in the middle of his book? Uh, we believe, many of us believe that King Solomon was the one who wrote this book. He doesn't put his name in there explicitly, so I want to give that caveat to you. But why would, as we believe, King Solomon came and did this, why would he be concerned about our worship? Well, it's amazing. He was one who was directly involved with the the building of uh, the temple there. Solomon's temple, right? He was putting this together, and I can imagine, as he was putting some effort forth and, and kind of directing some of these things, he would want to see that people are worshiping God well. So that's what we're going to talk about today. What does it look like for us to worship God well with everything that we have because we have been created to worship? Amen? Amen. Let's pray and ask for God to show us some things from his word. Father, we thank you so much that you have created us for a purpose. Lord, we're not here just on this earth spinning through space for no reason at all. Lord, you've created us with a design and with a purpose in mind. Lord, you've created us to reflect your glory back to you, to be able to give you worship, to give you praise, and with all that we have, all that uh, makes up who we are, Lord, we want to worship you. Lord, as we walk through these seven verses in Ecclesiastes today, I pray that you would help us to see your heart for our worship. Lord, we offer ourselves to you. Pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us in this time. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen, amen. All right, so today that's what we're going to see. We're going to see four different ways to engage in full body worship. We see four different ways. Uh, There are some more ways you can find throughout Scripture, but we're going to focus in on the ones that are here within our passage. The first one you can write down in your notes is this. You can pursue God with your feet. When we look down at our feet, we say, hey, what am I going to use these for? We can use them to pursue God. I think back to my childhood, and one thing I heard from my mom over and over was, 
the phrase here is where I am. If you ever remember back to when your parents would call you, come on over here, come on over. That's a skill that every child needs to learn, right? How to come to their parents when they are called. And so my mom would call us and we'd show up kind of close, but then she would say, here, when I say come here, here is where I am, right? So I found myself saying some of those same things. Anyone ever become a parent and you realize, wow, I'm saying the exact same things my parents used to say, right? Here is where I am. Come on, kids, come on close to me. Come on closer. Why don't you come and let's enjoy. We can talk, we can catch up, and I can give you some affection and some affirmation, and, and I can let you know about what it means that we are a part of a wonderful family together. And don't you know God says the same thing for us? Come here. Come close to me. Here is where I am. And our feet should take us to where God is. That's what we see in our first verse, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. If you've got your Bibles, make sure you open up in your Bible or your Bible app to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. Let me read for us that first sentence, and we're going to see what it means for us to pursue God with our feet. It says this, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. And we look at that, and everyone in this room, I believe, used their feet today to come to church. You got up this morning, you got in your car, you came over here, you came up the steps inside, you stood for a while, and now we are here together to be near God. But most Sundays, I don't go out of my house to think, man, I really got to guard my steps. I've really got to make sure that my feet are protected, that I guard my steps and my feet. I don't normally think that way. But what this passage is telling us is that as we are pursuing God, there are things that can come and try to put a stop to our pursuits of God. The way that we walk is something that is subject to attacks or failures. You know, first we may see uh, some failures. We could see our feet taking us somewhere that is not a place of worship. Or you could see a way that our feet are taking us somewhere. Hey, maybe instead of going and drawing near to the master, instead our feet are taking us over to a place of materialism, lead, leading us toward things and believing that uh, possessions are going to ultimately satisfy us. Maybe our feet at times, when they should be bringing us closer to the Lord, instead they're taking us closer to a place of lust. Sometimes our feet, instead of going and being able to care for someone and, uh, and be compassionate towards someone, instead we fall and we go and we find ourselves seeking whatever is most comfortable. Our feet can take us lots of different places, but we are called today to guard our steps, to allow our steps to, to take us near the Lord. But it's not only things within us that can distract us, there are things outside of us, because there are demonic forces that are a reality within our world. There are demonic forces, whether Satan or his demons, who are trying to hit us with doubt, discouragement, despair, where we come to that place and say, oh, I don't know, I think I'm going to go a little bit astray. I'm going to go over here and see what else the world has to offer instead of keeping my eyes on the Lord. So we need to be careful. As we see God, we need to guard our steps, guard our feet so that we can seek God out with those feet. You know, I heard a pretty cool story this last week uh, from a woman who is a professor at MIT. That's a pretty prestigious place to be a professor. Her name is Rosalind Picard, and she shares a story of how she met her creator. When she was in high school, she started to realize that she was pretty smart. She realized that she had some, a good brain, and she had this good intellect. She was passing all her tests, and she came to a place where she said, you know what? I think that any spiritual or religious beliefs are things that are reserved for the weak-minded. Because I'm so smart, I don't think I need to think about that whole God thing. So that's kind of how she went through her life. And she was a babysitter there in high school until one day she was talking with some of the people that she babysat for, whom she had a lot of respect for. I believe the gentleman was a doctor, his wife was an intellectual as well, and so in her conversation she came to have a lot of respect for them. And one day they invited her to come to church with them. 
And she was shocked. She thought, okay, these people are smart people. I know they do their homework on what they believe. And these people go and they worship a God. And so God started to give her opportunities to take baby steps toward God. She had some exposure uh, to the Lord as a result of that relationship, but she kept giving excuses and never showed up to church. A little bit later on, when she was, I believe, in college, she had some people that she knew, and someone invited her to come over to church, and she finally went. And what she realized was, as somebody encouraged her, somebody told her, it's not about just going to church, it's about what you believe. Why don't you go ahead and read God's Word? So she decided to pick up a copy of the Bible. She started reading through the book of Proverbs. There we go with King Solomon again, some wisdom. And she was shocked when she was reading the book of Solomon, or, sorry, the book of uh, Proverbs, uh, at the wisdom that she found. She kept finding that she had to stop and think about this thing that she realized was true, and it was what God was saying through his word. Finally, she found herself in a church where a pastor got her attention when he asked, Who is the Lord of your life? For a long time, she had been living under the assumption that she was the captain of her own ship. She was determining her own destiny. But at that point, she realized that she wanted Jesus instead to be the Lord of her life. And she prayed, Jesus Christ, I ask you to be Lord of my life. And what she says is that her life went from feeling like a flat, one-dimensional black and white picture to being a 3D color image. Like she was recognizing what the world was for the very first time. And that's because she came to know Jesus as her Lord and Savior. And now she is a professor there at MIT, uh, at the top university in her field. She says she works closely with people whose lives are filled with medical struggles people whose children are not healthy. She said she doesn't have adequate answers to explain all their suffering, but she knows there's a God of unfathomable greatness and love who freely enters into relationship with all who confess their sins and call upon his name. She thought she was too smart for God, but it turned out God had created and designed her intellect so that she could worship God with it. It's amazing. I love hearing that. All those steps along the way where God gave her an opportunity to take a step closer to the Lord. She sought him uh, through uh, going to church, so through giving her life to him, through seeking him in his word. And that's what we're called to as well. When we've got steps, uh, we see a way that we can draw near to God that we would do that. So that's the first thing, right? We shall pursue God with our feet. But there's another way that we should pursue God, and that's that we should listen to God with our ears. Our ears are here so that we can listen, right? We got two of them, and, uh, and we've been, our ears have been created so that we can listen, and especially so we can listen to God. You know, I heard a story this week about three friends who went hunting. Three friends decided to go deer hunting. It was a lawyer, a doctor, and a preacher. Now, you can probably already tell whether or not this story is true or not, so uh, I'll just carry along with that. Well, it says this. As they were walking along, they were looking out for deer, and finally they found this huge buck came out of the woods. So all of them turned, and they shot their guns all at the same time, the lawyer, the doctor, and the preacher. And uh, so they shot, and they, as soon as they shot the buck, it went down, and they went over. They wanted to see how big it was, you know, how big the antlers are, and that's all important. They were trying to figure it out, and they, they realized that they weren't sure who it was who had shot this buck. They said, man, we need somebody to help us. So they called in a game official. A game official came over, and he was going to help them out discover who it was that had shot the buck. And so he came over. He was looking at the deer, and, and he said, hey, guys, I want to let you know I know who it was that shot this deer. They said, oh, really? Who was it? And he said, it was the preacher. They said, wow. How could you tell that it was the preacher that shot this deer? And he said, well, I've been in church enough that I know this deer got shot and the bullet went in one ear and out the other. And that's how I know it was the preacher. All right? Some of us, our experience in church has been similar. We go and we hear what God says, whether it's in his word or in a sermon, and it goes in one ear and out the other. But that's not what we're called. We're called to actually listen to God with our ears. Take a look at the second half of that first verse. Chapter 5, verse 1 says this. 
To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. You look at that and you say, wait a second, wait a second. There is a way to go through the, the motions. Here's somebody that is called a fool. The sacrifice of fools. They're going through the motions. They're doing the sacrifices, but it is empty because their heart is not really in it. And he says what's better than that is to actually listen to God. There's a way to go through the motions of religious ritual, but to still be a fool who doesn't know God. And God really isn't interested in outward appearances. He really isn't interested in, doing, in us doing things just so that people around us can see us doing something that looks spiritual or looks super devoted. What God wants is someone who is drawing near to him, ready to listen, ready to hear and put it into our lives. We're invited to draw near to listen, and that's actually... Uh, illustrated for us in a really beautiful way in Luke chapter 10. If, you've, if you're here today, you've probably heard of uh, Mary and Martha, two different friends of Jesus, Mary and Martha. And Jesus went over to their home and he was going to have some great time. Jesus, Mary, Martha, Lazarus was probably there too. And, uh, and, and Martha is like, all right, we got to get things taken care of. She sets to work. She's getting the food ready. She's making sure everything is exactly where it is. And the passage uses this word that she is busy serving. Now, serving is a good thing to do, but there is something that's actually better. And within our passage, Jesus found Mary at his feet. Jesus must have started to be talking or sharing the truth about God. I'm not sure what he was sharing, but anything that's coming out of the mouth of Jesus is important to listen to. And so Mary found herself at the feet of Jesus, listening to him. And Martha's like, come on now, Mary, we got things to do. What are you doing over here just sitting and listening to Jesus? How come that's what's taking up your time, Mary? And so Martha goes to Jesus and says, Hey, Jesus, could you tell Mary to come help me out? And Jesus says, No, 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 no. Martha, you got it all wrong. Yes, it's good to serve. But Mary has chosen what's even better, to come and listen to me at my feet. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Anybody else in here suffer from Martha syndrome like me? Yeah. Sometimes that's my tendency. Hey, let's go get some things done. Let's go get to work. Let's go cross some things off the to-do list. I got a lot of ways to take care of my family. I got some things I need to do at my workplace. I got some things I need to do in different places that I have oversight. But at times that comes first before listening like Jesus' good friend, Mary. We're called to listen and be those who listen. That's my prayer for all of us. Lord, make us good listeners like your friend, Mary. So the question I have for you in regards to this second point is, are your ears ready to worship? Now, you probably didn't walk into church today and say, all right, are my ears ready? Okay, I think I'm good to go. I'm ready for worship. But this passage is telling us we should be ready for those moments when God's Spirit is at work within us, prompting us to follow Him in different aspects of obedience. So when you're living your life and you have that sudden question, I wonder if God wants me to fill in the blank. I wonder if God wants me to go walk across the street and talk to my neighbor. I heard something just happened within their family. Does God want me to go be a blessing to my neighbor? We should be listening to His call in our life. Or maybe you feel that still small voice saying, hey, maybe God wants me to choose a different form of entertainment than I chose last night. God, is that you calling me? Let's walk in obedience. Maybe it's you saying, hey, God, are you, are you calling me to be baptized, to proclaim my faith through the waters of baptism, or to step into a new way of serving? When we hear, or when we believe we hear, God at work within our life, calling us. When we got that impression, I believe God's calling me to do this, and what it, what you, what it is that you think he's telling you lines up with Scripture, go for it. Walk in obedience. Take those steps of faith that we hear. Heard a story this week about a little girl named Beverly, a three-year-old girl 
She's sitting in her living room. She's playing with her toys. Her mom was there too. And her mom noticed that she had gotten some stains all over her shirt from lunch. And so she called out to Beverly. She said, hey, Beverly. She didn't hear anything. Beverly's just playing with her toys. And the mom gets a little louder. Hey, Beverly, come over here. And uh, she doesn't hear anything back. So what do you got to do at that point? You got to use their full name, right? So she calls out, Beverly Elizabeth Provost. Come on over here. Did you hear me? And so little Beverly said, Yes, Mama. My, er my ears heard you, but my legs didn't hear you. Sometimes our he ears hear God, but the rest of us, it feels like, didn't hear God. But we should not be ones who just are hearers of the truth, but who are doers of his word as well. All right, so what do we got so far? We got our feet. Our feet should be pursuing God, bringing us closer to Him. We've got our ears. Our ears should be ready to listen, ready to hear what He has to say for us. And uh, next, we've got something that's on our face. We've got a part of our face. It's a big one. No, it's not our nose, although I definitely would be interested to hear a sermon about how to worship God with our nose. But this is what it is. Number three, we should honor God with our mouth. We are called to honor God with the words that come out of our lips. Now here's a crazy thing that we're going to see in our passage. It's very interesting. It sounds like a really good thing to make God big promises. It sounds like we should be, yes, God, if you answer this prayer, I promise I will never fill in the blank ever again. Or maybe, hey, God, if you give me this one thing that I want, I will always fill in the blank for the rest of of my life. Sometimes we think like that and we want to make big promises to God, but what we're going to see in our passage is that we should be very careful about overestimating how, uh, how, uh, how much we can come through for God. We shouldn't overpromise God the things that we are not going to be able to do. Now, this story might help you understand a little bit of what that looks like. There's a guy named Bill McCartney. Ever, anybody here ever heard of Bill McCartney who's in the football world? Uh, he actually was the head coach at the University of Colorado in the 1980s. And he also uh, was the founder of a ministry called Promise Keepers. And what he did when he went, he finally got a job as the head coach of the University of Colorado. He was so excited, and he also made this promise. He was telling people around him, I got this job, but I want you to know God's going to come first, my family's going to come second, and football is going to come third. Well, as he had started in this new job, he was excited because uh, the football program was in a bad spot. So as he started to invest in some different things and they started to win and things started to go really well, he recognized that he had lost sight of his commitment to God. Finally, uh, eight years down the road into this job, he won the national championship in 1990. And a lot of people said, wow, great job, man. You've reached the pinnacle of your career. What a great job. You really have arrived. But at that moment, he realized that he had abandoned his commitment to God. And so what he realized that he needed to do, what he had done within his work, he had come to a place where it all felt empty because he had left God behind. So that, I believe, is why he started that ministry, Promise Keepers, to be following through as men of integrity, to be following through on what God has called us to do and our commitments to him. So let's take a look at this passage. It has a lot to say about how we should use our mouth in worship. We should be careful not to overpromise and underdeliver to God. Take a look with me at verse 2. Be not rash with your mouth. Don't let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. God's perfect. He sits enthroned in majesty, and we are fallible human beings here on earth. Therefore, it finishes up, verse 3, let your words be few. Let your words be few. You know, it's easy to talk a big game, right? God, this is going to be the week. I'm going to follow through for you all over the place. I'm going to go share the gospel with my neighbors. I'm going to be honest with, uh, with people about who you are, God. I'm going to follow through. I'm going to do everything. The things that I struggled with last week, that's not going to be an issue anymore. God, I promise you, kind of bringing back that vow motif, well, the problem is that we are humans. We're sinful humans. 
and we fail. And so one of the things that we need to remember, as I was reminded so many times this week, God, I want to be the man you want me to be. But sometimes I say things that later on I'm like, why in the world did I say that? That's not what I want to be talking like. That's not the way that I want to be living for you, God. Why do I continue to struggle in this body, in this sinful flesh? The reality is we are each, uh, we are each individuals who will face our failures and what a good reminder that is for us over and over how much we need God. Sometimes we think, all right, God, you saved me. I'm good to go. From here on out, I'm just going to be smooth sailing. But as we sang a minute earlier, we need him. I need you how I need you every hour. I need you. Verse 4 uh, tells us a little bit more about uh, when we make commitments to God. It says, When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Play, pay what you vow. This is talking about financial commitments that people would uh, make back in the day. At that point, we've done similar things at uh, different building projects that we've had where people can come and say, hey, I'm going to make a financial commitment, and this is what I believe my generosity is going to look like in the coming years. Now, what he's saying in this passage is, hey, follow through on the commitments that you've made. Now, uh, I don't believe this is any license for us to go out and be hunting people down and say, hey, you committed to this, so we're going to hold you to that. Of course, we're going to encourage each other to do that. But we recognize both the fact that there is grace under the cross of Jesus Christ and that it's a legitimate act of worship to follow through on our commitments to him. So that's important to keep kind of both of those things in mind as we're seeking him. Then here near the end of it, verse 5 says this. Well, let's, uh, or sorry, verse 6. Let not your mouth lead you into sin, and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? That's a fearful thing. For God to be opposed to the work of your hands because you've decided uh, to turn a blind eye to what God's calling you to do, May that never be true of us. That really is a fearful thing. Uh, the bottom line here really is that worship is something that should not be done flippantly. We should approach the throne of grace uh, reverently, soberly, and with full follow-through. You know, maybe you're here today, you're like, all right, I want to use my mouth to worship God. What does that look like? What does that look like to use my mouth for the purpose that I've been created for of worshiping God? Well, it's really easy to fall into the opposite, right? To use our mouth for the wrong things. It's easy to yell at our family, to yell at our kids, kind of get really bent out of shape for this or that. It's easy to uh, get a little sarcastic maybe with some of our coworkers, some of the individuals in our lives who are a little bit more difficult to deal with. It's easy to sing along with some of those songs that come on the radio, whether they're new songs or whether they're old songs, songs that aren't exactly worship, uh, worshipful or family-friendly or what have you. What does that look like for us to use our mouths for worship? I've got a couple verses to share with you. One's from the Old Testament, Psalm chapter 40. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. That's cool. He's using his mouth to praise God, to worship him. And as a result, there are those around him who uh, will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Now we've got an example from the New Testament, from Hebrews chapter 13. It says, Let us continually offer up a sacrifice. What kind of sacrifices are we offering up to God? Let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledges his name. So what does it look like to worship God with our mouth? It means to acknowledge him, to acknowledge his work within our lives. When someone compliments you on something or says, hey, great job, or it's really cool to see the transformation in your life, give the glory to God. Hey, I got to be honest, it's God who is doing these things in my life. It means worshiping, coming on Sunday mornings and worshiping with others and allowing that time of worship not to close down the moment you walk out the back door, but to live in a pattern of worship the whole week long. And it means speaking accurately about our need for him and maybe even taking the time to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ 
with those who are around us. As we worship Jesus with every part of our body, let's worship every day with the mouth that God has given us. All right. So, so far we got our feet. Our feet are given to us so that we can pursue God. Our ears are given to us so that we can listen, so that we can heed what it is that God's calling us to do. Our mouth, we're called in this passage to honor God with our mouth. What do you think is going to be next? All right, well, I just kind of put them all in there. We just got a kind of a catch-all here at the end that's actually expressed within our worship. We should worship God with reverent posture. Every part of us, the entire way that we position ourselves before God should worship Him. In this, uh, in this exercise motif we've been running with this morning, uh, it's important as you exercise to exercise with good form, right? If you're doing some squats or, or some bench presses or something, like that, you've got to have the right posture. Now, um, I've got a friend who does like some power lifting, all right? So, um, so he, he took me one time and said, hey, let's go work out. And I'm like, all right, you're a power lifter. I'm a well, I'm not quite a lifter. So, uh, <laughs> so we went over there, and he's like, yeah, here's what you're going to do. We're going to get this, this much weight on here. I think you can do it, and uh, make sure that you have good posture and stuff. And uh, on the count of three, you're going to like try your best to, to do this. And I'm thinking, like, okay, like, yeah, I got it. And the real trainer was like over there looking at us like, you guys should not be doing it like that, all right? But uh, I started to do that, and I'm like, oh, man, I'm like, my goodness. And uh, what I realized was it's really important to have good, proper posture. I don't know for sure that I hurt myself that day, but it's definitely possible because uh, I'm not sure if I was using the right posture. But here's the thing. When we come before God, we should not come flippantly. We should not come walking in like, all right, Jesus and me, we're cool, yeah. All right, he'll be ready for me when I, when I decide I'm good and ready to come and draw near to God. Oh yeah, he's good. God, uh, I'd love for you to be able to give me some more of the things that I've asked for. Would you please do that? No, we should come before God with an absolutely reverent posture, recognizing his glory, his majesty, his perfection, his holiness, his goodness that stands in utterly stark contrast with the sin that we were born with. That's actually one of the things that we kind of hear a little bit in the story about Albert Einstein. A little girl asked uh, Albert Einstein if scientists pray. And so Albert Einstein started to explain some of the things that he had seen within the universe. He said he couldn't believe that there was no God because when he looks out at the universe, he recognized it was an absolutely magnificent, uh, designed place with so many different laws. And here's how he described it. He described his study in the world of science um, and the universe as like a little kid going into a library with books in all different languages. A little child who can't yet read and is looking around and recognizing somebody wrote all these books. Somebody put all these things here. There's some sort of order, that alphabetical order that things are taking place in. And like a little child, we would look with wonder start to look and see, is there anything I can glean from here? And that's what Albert Einstein said his study in science was like. That's the truth. We see the universe marvelously arranged, obeying certain laws, but only dimly understand these laws. We're still trying to figure it out, what God has created. When we come before God to worship him, we must come in a posture of awe, of fear, and reverence. That's what we see in our final verse for today, uh, verse 7. Chapter 5, verse 7. Why don't you read that with me? For when dreams increase and words grow many... There is vanity, but God is the one you must fear. And you may be sitting here like, okay, what does dreams have to do with anything? Why are we talking about dreams? Yeah, I had a weird dream last night, but I don't really think it has any bearing on my life. Well, at different points within history, people would believe different things about dreams. Uh, some people uh, at this point uh, thought that dreams may have been a message from God. Now it's true, God at times has communicated. We can see in the Old Testament, Daniel and Joseph and all those things, God at times communicates through dreams. Even one time I was in Uganda and I visited uh, some missionaries there and they had someone who was there working with them who said, they said, oh yes, this young lady, she comes from a Muslim family. But Jesus was revealed to her in a dream and she recognized that Jesus is the Son of God. And that's why she is a Christian now because God appeared to her in a dream in that way. That's pretty cool that God can use things like that. 
But the reason it's mentioned in this passage is some people would get really freaked out by their dreams. Something would happen and they'd say, oh no, is this what's going to happen to me? I'm really scared. We've got to talk about this. We've got to figure out all these different things. And that's why it says, when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity. Those are not the things that we should be fearing within our lives. Instead, whom should we fear? The verse finishes up, God is the one you must fear. God's the one we must fear. That fear of God is really kind of is just describing just an attitude of holy reverence before God. And when we understand that we are the created, we are the ones who have been created by Him, we should have this openness toward Him of being instructed. Lord, would you tell me what's true? Lord, would you impress to me what you want me to know? God, I approach you with a posture of fear. So what posture is it that we should take? The proper form for our full body worship is one of reverent awe and honor for God. He made us so that we would worship Him. He gave us an opportunity to know who He is so that we can worship Him. He gave us feet so that we can pursue Him, ears so that we can hear Him, mouths so that we can sing those praises back to Him. I was thinking of this last week. Uh, I love being able to participate in worship. I love seeing expressive worship. And I know there are some people who are, who are there and are thinking about the words and are, and are thinking, Lord, I worship you for these things. I know there are some cultures where everybody's got their hands up, right? Everybody's clapping and dancing. It's a beautiful thing to see some of that expression in worship, to see that posture of, yes, God, we worship you with everything that we have. And this week I was thinking about that as both of those can be used for God's glory. I was thinking about what does it look like for us, maybe, maybe first in a physical sense, is there, any, is there ever a time that each of us find ourselves in a place of physical reverence before the Lord, down on our knees, bowed before Him, lifting up our hands. Maybe it's just you in your own bedroom listening to some worship music or after you read some scripture and you just put your hands up before God and say, God, I worship you. This is the posture that we're called to as individuals. And sometimes it doesn't take that physical form, right? Because a little bit early on, what did we hear? God doesn't just want an outward thing. He doesn't want us to be fools. So, oh, I'm going to go through a religious ritual, but I don't actually believe it in my heart. No, what does it mean for us to be engaged both from a physical, mental, spiritual sense to wholly worship God with reverent posture? So the question I have for you as we close out today is, how much of your body is engaged in worshiping Him? Are you skipping spiritual leg day? Is there a part of you where you say, yes, God, I worship you with everything, but this part of me over here, no, that's still mine. I'm holding on to that. Please leave this alone over here. What does it mean for us to come before Him and say, God, I worship you with everything? No holds barred. All of me, you can have it. I worship you from my beginning to my end. Are our feet taking us closer to God or taking us farther away from Him? Are our ears listening to Him or is it going in one ear and out the other? Are our mouths committed to honoring Him, not over-promising the things, not overestimating how much that we can do, puffing ourselves up, but instead to say, God, I honor you with my worship and I'm going to do it recognizing the fact that I need your grace every day. May each of us worship God with our whole bodies, everything that we have. Let's pray.